All right, everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming. I know it's, it's late in the day on the first day of reInvent. Um, this is Healthcare 309. Um, we're nearing the end of our Healthcare and Life Sciences uh, pre-days, and I'm very glad uh, to be here today. My name is Aaron Friedman. I'm a partner solutions architect with AWS, and I lead uh, tech in working with our Healthcare and Life Sciences partner ecosystem. And those are, are folks like our, our systems integrators like RainCloud, as well as our stellar group of, of ISVs. And today we're gonna to be talking to you about the American Heart Association and, and how to, they have worked with, with RainCloud to build a secure and collaborative precision medicine platform on AWS. But before we, we get into that, you know, let's, let's take a step back and just and talk about data, right? Regardless of if you're an academic institution or you're a commercial entity, if you're in financial services or healthcare or life sciences or media and entertainment, data be, is, is foundational to how you operate a successful business. We see organizations you know, across every industry really adopt a, a data-first strategy as they look to drive insights to propel their business forward. These are things like figuring out what new products to launch, or in, in our case, because this is a, a healthcare pre-day, how the data and the insights that you get from data can, can really transform human health. And when we look across industries, we sort of see that um, really there are six buckets to how organizations often approach data. And this is what you know, we hear from customers again and again, there's this concept of first and foremost, how do I secure data? We are, of course, in the healthcare industry, data security is paramount. We are dealing with protected health information, you know, critical information about patients, and you know, ultimately we need to protect that information um, because it's, it's personal, right? And, and, and security is foundational to everything we do. Beyond that, there's, you know, first and foremost, how do we acquire data? How do we get data into say some type of platform that, that we're building. And these can be things like medical wearables, it could be historical claims data, clinical trials, uh, genomics data, really disparate data sources that we need to have solutions with which we can acquire data and subsequently store it in a way that is scalable, cost effective, and in, in a way that you can easily catalog the, the multitude of data that, that's coming in so that you can efficiently you know, analyze it in the future. Once you get that data in, of course, the, one of the next things that you often have to do is some type of processing on it, whether it's genomics processing where you're taking raw files, say from an Illumina NovaSeq or HiSeq X and transforming those into variant call format files or you're, you're taking in some raw data source and needing to extract transfer load ETL it into a format that's more amenable for analysis, data processing is usually critical to how you accelerate and really you know, move data into a structured format that's amenable for discovery. And of course, analysis is, is, is really you know, why organizations pride their data sets uh, so, so much, why they're so valuable, because that is what you know, really drives business forward. And, and ultimately, you know, we are, you know, AWS of course is a global organization. We work with many different global organizations, both in healthcare and life sciences and, and in other industries as well. And, and fundamentally, there needs to be a way to securely distribute data and analyze data while concurrently you know, maintaining the, the data sovereignty requirements that are, you know, are, are, are critical, right? You, you have, you know, HIPAA in, in the US, you have GDPR, you have all these global regulations, so how do we distribute data in a way that is consistent with these regulatory frameworks? And one of the things that we've seen really, um, you know, come to fruition over the last several years and a lot of customers are adopting is this concept of a data lake. And I often like to think of a data lake as a source of truth, and it's more than just you know, the, the, the repository for all your knowledge. It's the associated metadata with that knowledge and the ability to, to catalog it in a way that makes it easily uh, retrievable so that the users that are supposed to have access to it and need to have access to it can do so in an efficient fashion. 
And there are many stakeholders in a data lake. There are, of course, the data providers. So you can imagine, right, researchers from academic institutions uploading their data sets into a platform. There are uh, data governance uh, bodies, data governors. You have analysts, whether you're doing you know, ad hoc querying over data sets, whether you're running you know, state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms, or you know, really trying to, to get as much information and much, as much context from those, those data sources as, as you can. So there's really this, this wide array of stakeholders on a data lake. And you know, fundamentally, right, it's this way of, of storing data, but also the way of uh, cataloging it so that you can retrieve um, the data of interest easily. And I want to revert back to a couple slides ago and talk about a couple of these buckets in more detail and how that might look on AWS. Now, of course, this is only one way to the approach the problem. There are you know, many, many ways that, that customers are, are building successful implementations for all those different buckets. Some are using native AWS services. Some are working with our stellar uh, partner ecosystem, our ISVs and systems integrators to, to really um, advance and, and iterate rapidly. But you can think about the data processing layer as, you know, Let's, let's think about it in the context of ETL, right? So you have perhaps an API and say, hey, I need to process these objects and convert them into these formats. So what might you do? Well, the first step would be, of course, to retrieve them and figure out where they are. So you might use, uh, basically develop a state machine, perhaps with AWS step functions that does this. So the first step that step functions might do is go to your data catalog that contains all the locations of your data and effectively build a data manifest that returns back, say, maybe a JSON object that contains pointers in Amazon S3 to where everything uh, resides. It then goes through and, you know, perhaps using AWS Batch, uh, which, you know, orchestrates um, elastically on top of Amazon EC2 to, to process that data in a quick and efficient and high throughput fashion. These result sets can, of course, be stored back or staged back in Amazon S3, or perhaps you're pushing some data in a structured format into Redshift, your, your data warehouse. And with that, of course, you're continuing to update your data catalog so that the metadata of your, your knowledge repository continues to be in sync. And what this gives you the ability to do then is to analyze data in a much more efficient manner. And what's nice is you can apply similar architectural principles and patterns to the data analysis layer as you do to data processing. You again can go and now with your perhaps newly updated data catalog, go and via a new state machine, retrieve that data manifest. And based on where that, you know, those data reside, you can do different things with it. Perhaps you need to run machine learning algorithms using our new P3 instances um, in our deep learning AMI. So you may run a machine learning algorithm or training algorithm on, on Amazon EC2. You may use Spark on Amazon EMR or query data via Redshift. But you can imagine that no matter where your data resides, you may store those result sets back in Amazon S3 for easy retrievability and then apply a business int intelligence tool on top of it so that you can you know, perhaps put it in a context that is meaningful to some of your business stakeholders. So these are things like um, Amazon QuickSight, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Tableau, Click, et cetera. Um, and you can either potentially query the data natively in S3 or use an intermediary such as Amazon Athena to, to interact with your data sets. And to get a little more specific in healthcare and life sciences, you know, we, we split this up um, here at AWS, and the way that we talk about it is healthcare are payers and providers and the, the solutions that enable them, and life sciences is often genomics, biotech, pharma, and medical device, and of course then the solutions that enable those. But you know, whether you're doing things like precision medicine or real-world evidence or clinical trials or population health, again, data is just paramount. And, and what I think is very motivating for myself and you know, Prad and Steve is, and, and others in this room is, is the fact that the analyses that we do, the systems that we develop, really have 
the potential to transform healthcare. And that directly or indirectly relates to improving the, the way people live their lives. In precision medicine in particular, um, we have many companies or customers and partners on AWS that are building these type of platforms are enabling precision medicine at scale. DNA Nexus and Etica Genome are collaborating to, to do things like work with Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego and in neonatal intensive units to do this sort of rapid secure sequencing to, to identify um, you know, potential disease in, 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 uh, in infants and, and correct it or, or institute the appropriate interventions to, to improve their outcomes. We have you know, folks like Illumina and Seven Bridges and SIAPS and, and of course the American Heart Association who I'm really excited to, to hear about today. But I like to think really quickly about you know, precision medicine to set the context as the thing we see in a lot of our coins, right? E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Because fundamentally what we're trying to do here is apply the, the principles of population health and treat the, um, the individual based on a population's worth of knowledge and take that context back to, to their you know, individualized treatment based on what we've learned before. And you know, with that, I'm really excited to hand it off to Prod and, and, and learn more about the AHA and their initiative um, to advance uh, precision medicine on AWS. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I also wanted to take a brief moment to thank Amazon and Amazon Web Services for putting together such a such a phenomenal event, and it's, it's really exciting to, to actually have the opportunity to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the transformational aspects of areas that AHA is, uh, is working in that we think is going to transform the future of, of healthcare. Uh, my name is Prad. I, I have this unique opportunity within the association for working on these emerging uh, health strategies of the AHA where uh, we're looking at sort of where the hockey puck is going to land 10, 15, 20 years from now, working both within the organization as well as cross-functionally, uh, across with the volunteer leadership and several strategic advisory folks on, on predicting where this hockey puck is going to land and what are the focus areas that AHA needs to refocus our, our, our focus, you know, in, investments in. Um, and a lot of these sort of cross-intersect on this, uh, this area that involves science, research, uh, healthcare, tech, and data. And, and, and it's, it's, you know, we, we love uh, you know, coming to, to areas like these and, and talking to smart people and, and having the, uh, the ability to share some of the work that we've done. Uh, for a little over 93 years, uh, the American Heart Association has been, uh, uh, has been focused on and investing in cutting edge research. Uh, and at any given point in time, the, uh, the association funds a uh, little over 2,000 grants uh, that come uh, heavily focused on basic science, population science, and, uh, and now increasingly pre precision science and clinical science. Uh, at its heart, the association is a scientific research enterprise uh, that, that focuses heavily on trying to help improve the outcomes for, uh, for cardiovascular diseases. Uh, while we've, you know, we've been working on this for, for a long time, and we bask in what we consider is the generosity of little over 34 million individuals who work on the grassroots fronts. These are individuals who participate in many programs and campaigns of the American Heart Association from a grassroots perspective. Uh, the other end of the spectrum represents a little over 35,000 academic professionals, uh, researchers, clinicians who, who represent the scientific think tank of the organization. Uh, and while we've made tremendous amount of progress, uh, the, the future holds some significant uh, uh, challenges for the organization. Uh, you know, as you can see, you know, cardiovascular disease uh, are the number one cause of death around the world. Every two seconds, uh, somebody around the world uh, uh, dies from cardiovascular disease or complications related to the uh, cardiovascular syndrome. Uh, 17.5 million deaths occur every year around the world, uh, and while it, the, the human toll is absolutely staggering. The economical costs associated behind these are equally staggering. Uh, you know, as of today, you know, the, the cost of cardiovascular disease is predicted to be 
little over $900 billion. And over the next decade, by 2030, uh, it, it is expected to, to exceed about a trillion dollars uh, uh, or, or much higher than that. And, and this uh, is a unsustainable trend. And we uh, at the American Heart Association, as we, as we look at our core mission, which is all about improving health and, and well-being of individuals. Uh, this is at the core of everything American Heart Association does uh, and, 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 and focuses on. Um, you know, we live in an era that, uh, you know, that's heavily focused on technology and data. And, uh, you know, and we've been thinking about you know, how do we kind of bring together and accelerate science using the power of uh, science and technology and data. Uh, you know, imagine this world where, where patients and individuals are in control of their data. And imagine this world where patient data can be shared uh, you know, by millions of people 24 by 7. Imagine a world where data sharing is promoted and pushed and incentivized. Uh, and it's a cultural norm versus trying to hoard it. Um, and, and, and open collaborations and open innovation is supported. And you know, as, we, as we think about many of these aspects, and imagine this world where analytics and the latest tools and technologies and, and capabilities are made available to the research community in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, you know, and, and, and also create a incubation center where newer technologies and tools could be incubated for, for one purpose, which is improving patient outcomes. And these are the many different aspects that, uh, that, that the American Heart Association has been working on and thinking about uh, for the past several, uh, several years. Uh, from that spirit, we, we created the Institute for Precision Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, and it was founded on several key principles. Uh, first and foremost, what it, was, it was created to actually set a global agenda for precision cardiovascular medicine. We live in this era of, of data where, uh, where we want to democratize data. Uh, we we want to pursue and make data discoverable and accessible uh, in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, we want to do kind of responsible, sustainable sharing of the data. We want to pursue open public-private partnerships where uh, where we bring together parties who bring a core competency that doesn't naturally come from one organization. And you know, over the past several years, we've been very successful in, in carving some real, really unique partnerships. And one of those is our, our partnership with Amazon Web Services and the work we've been doing with them. Um, you know, one of the unique things about AHA and, and, and is that we, we believe that we are kind of the honest broker and a convener that will bring together parties that normally wouldn't talk to each other. So these could be the, the federally funded organizations and agencies, uh, academic institutions, nonprofit organizations that are outside of the cardiovascular domain, um, as well as uh, industry, you know, pharmaceuticals, biotech, uh, and, and, and a whole suite of, of organizations that represent healthcare and life sciences. Uh, and, and you know, we think we as the AHA can play that honest broker convener role where, uh, where many others uh, have, uh, you know, would openly come uh, come to the organization. And of course, at the heart of this, data is the part of, uh, is the glue that connects everything. And we, within the Institute, we wanted to bring together different diverse data sets. These are genomic data sets that exist out there. These are phenotypic data sets that are out there. These are clinical data registries that uh, are, several of them are, are federally funded uh, in, in, in the United States as well as in, the, uh, in several of the European organizations. Uh, they're looking at different types of omics data sets, you know, proteomics and other kind of omics data sets. And you're looking at, you know, this whole new explosion of patient-generated, self-generated data, which is this high-fidelity, high-frequency, low-fidelity data uh, intersecting with this low-frequency, high-fidelity data that comes from EMR and layering on top uh, the, the social uh, data sets that are already available. So we, you know, this is, these are the kind of data sets that we have been incubating and trying to bring together uh, in, a, a, uh, in a way that, that we feel would benefit the community in a way that, uh, that hasn't been done before. Uh, last year at, at Sessions, we, uh, which is just after Amazon's reInvent, we, we struck a strategic relationship with Amazon Web Services where we launched the Precision Medicine platform. Uh, and the, the vision behind the Precision Medicine platform was to actually create a a global data and a technology marketplace where 
different data sets could be brought together and be made discoverable and accessible. And it also provide a way in which researchers could have a sandbox of sorts where they could, they could do high-end analytics. Um, you know, we, we launched this in November. We went from you know, data that belonged from you know, a few data sets, small data sets, from about 40,000 individuals to now, as of today, we have a little over 380 million data points coming from 2.4 million individuals. You're talking about data sets that are, uh, that are coming from, from clinical data registries. Uh, we have several partnerships, uh, including NHLBI, where we are now hosting several of their data sets. Uh, we also have consortiums. We have the Stroke Consortium. We are looking at deep GWAS data uh, that, that comes from several thousands of people coming in. Uh, we now also have image data that's, uh, that's, uh, that represents some of the CT scans and X-rays from, uh, from several thousands of people that is now being hosted within the construct of the precision medicine platform. We have data that represents claims data uh, that's in the platform. So overall, we, we have a data coming from about 30 different data sets that represents uh, four consortiums, MI, AFib, Stroke, and Heart, uh, and, and, and one, uh, and our partnerships with NHLBI and a few others. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the vision is to, to make this available to the research community. Uh, we, you know, we are extremely proud to, to, to see the growth in the platform over the last one year alone. Uh, if you peel the onion a little bit and you look underneath the hood, uh, you see that you know, this platform is powered by the technologies that Aaron talked about. Uh, you know, the search is, an, is enabled by Elasticsearch. Uh, it sits on a HIPAA compliant platform and it's HIPAA certified today. Uh, it's, you know, very soon we will have FISMA low, uh, FedRAMP low compliance, uh, thanks to NHLBI being willing to act as the ATO for us uh, so that we have the highest standard of, of data and security and privacy uh, within the platform. Um, when you look at the, the analytical environment, we use AppStream, which essentially opens up this unique gateway uh, through which uh, you know, data analytics can be done in the cloud. We use Jupyter Notebooks. And behind the scenes, we have a little over 85 apps that are available today to the researchers. Uh, these range from uh, pipeline management tools where you can slice and dice uh, genomics data. Uh, at the other end, you're looking at uh, Plink and Hale and you know, data statistical tools, Python and R. Uh, if you're into machine learning, uh, especially uh, with some of the image data, uh, we now have uh, the capability to push deep learning into it. So if you're into transfer learning or supervised learning or, or unsupervised learning or forced learning, uh, you can use tool sets like TensorFlow to actually build predictive models uh, in a way that, uh, that benefit you. And at the same time, we, you know, we sort of help uh, bring the, the data sets that uh, you know, AHA can help provision. Or if you have access to data that you already uh, you know, have been provisioned, uh, uh, you, can res you can bring it into the, uh, into the platform. Uh, so we, you know, there are many different aspects of, uh, of the platform that, that we see as a growth area. And it's, it's also incubating some of the, uh, the research community to bring tool sets and incubate tool sets that don't exist today. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it is powered uh, through, through some of the smart people at Amazon Web Services as well as uh, many others that we work with. Um, at the end of the day, you know, what's the problem that we are trying to solve? And, uh, you know, we, we within the American Heart Association feel that, you know, the new technologies and capabilities are being deployed to help accelerate science in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, we're trying to change the paradigm of how research is done, where, uh, where instead of data going to the researchers, the, the researchers come to the data. Uh, and, and then providing the analytical capabilities in a way that, uh, that, uh, that help benefit the community. Um, you know, one of our conscious efforts behind the scenes has been to, to push the use of open source technologies, uh, primarily to keep the cost of ownership uh, for the research community as low as possible. Um, and, and, and hopefully it will help drive the outcomes that, uh, that we, we see uh, will benefit the larger, uh, larger public health and, and the individuals. Um, I started this conversation saying, uh, talking about how AHA has a well-run portfolio of grants that, that we, we invest in every year uh, and have a proud tradition of doing so for the last 93 years. 
Um, one of the things that we have now done is we've created a whole new portfolio of what we call data and technology oriented grants uh, with the whole aim of trying to push the use of cloud and technology and all the innovation that comes uh, behind the use of the, the newer technology models to, to help benefit the community. And this year alone, we've, we've announced a little over $5 million in grants. But as you look at these grants, they tend to fall on four major buckets. Uh, we have what we call the data mining oriented grants, which are more focused on trying to identify patterns on existing data sets that, uh, that, ex you know, that, that help al also drive data harmonization standards uh, in many ways. Uh, we have methods validation grants where, where now you're looking at creating and validating and verifying uh, uh, algorithms that, uh, and, and predictive models that, uh, that help benefit a particular outcome. We have what we call the innovation development grants, which are more focused on trying to use cloud and technology in a way that hasn't been done before, uh, and coming up with derivative uh, tool sets and toolkits that, that can be shared with the larger community in a way that, uh, that help, uh, help advance the needle. Um, and then, of course, this notion that you need fellowship uh, awards, which really create a next generation of people who will take, take this work further. Uh, you know, at the highest level, we within the organization feel that this is the cross, cross intersection where a software engineer sits right next to a data engineer, who sits right next to a data scientist, who sits right next to a computational biologist, who sits right next to an informatics person, who sits right next to a clinician or a researcher, uh, in a way that that only that, that can be made possible just today. And, and this is our way of pushing it uh, in a way that that we feel will will have the biggest impact. Uh, we are also working on creating data challenges and hackathons and you know, this non-traditional way of, of convening the community. Again, with the whole aim of trying to, trying to leverage and push the, uh, the innovation that comes with open, uh, with open collaborations as well as uh, with, uh, with open innovation that follows very soon. Um, I'll leave with, uh, with the last slide, and, you know, which essentially represents our commitment uh, to help advance science. And while technology isn't the strategy and data isn't the strategy, it becomes really part of the core strategy to help accelerate uh, the mission of the AHA, which, which you know, our, our tagline in the AHA is life is why. And you know, we, we at the organization believe that to help advance uh, the, 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 the quality of health of the individuals, this is the absolutely the right thing to do. And, uh, and technology and data is going to play a key role. Um, I, I have to acknowledge the efforts of many, many people who work behind the scenes, uh, both internally within the organization as well as outside the organization, who always are making themselves available and working really hard. And these are some of the faces of, of many of those people who, who've made this vision uh, a reality for the organization. Um, I encourage you to all uh, you know, sign up and look at what we've done at precision.heart.org. Uh, and, and look at some of the some of the work that that has been made possible. Uh, you know, we love to, to collaborate with uh, with you. If you have an idea, if you have a concept, if you have a way of looking at uh, looking at a problem that we are not looking at, we'd love to love to hear that, and we'd love to uh, partner up with you. Uh, I think I'm going to bring up Steve Toback, who has helped architect the the platform. Uh, that really brings this vision to life along with our friends at Amazon Web Services uh, and, and really made this a reality in the last one year that we worked together. So, thank you. Thanks, Prad. <clears throat> so Prad sort of talked about the, how, the why of the platform, and I'm going to talk about the how and specifically what Amazon services were using to solve some of these problems for the larger community. But first, I want to talk about the last year, year and a half of the PMP. It started as a concept, uh, a proof of concept with Amazon Web Services and the American Heart Association. And they came up with three problems they're looking to solve fundamentally for the platform, for the community. To learn how to use these new types of technologies or uh, to learn what other scientists are doing in the realm of cardiovascular research is a core fundamental concept for the platform. To be able to search across data sets, 
to find data sets that you may not be aware of as a researcher, to find different ways of doing analysis, all needs to be part of the platform. And then obviously discovery and being able to find cures or uh, traits of heart disease that can help us live better lives. Great as a concept, but to bring it to production, we needed to make it secure and compliant. And when the POC was done, and AHS said, we want to go ahead with this, then they had to find a partner, and that's how RainCloud got involved. And I've been working on the platform for a little over a year since then. And today it's up live at precision.heart.org. You can go there and sign up uh, and take a look at it. And if we walk through each of these learn, search, and discover concepts, today learn is a couple of things. We use a, an open source tool called Jupyter Notebooks to surface different ways of doing statistical analysis on the platform. So we have those surfaced under learn on the platform today. We have a forum system running today on the platform so researchers can communicate. They can communicate securely about different data sets and what's in the data. They can communicate about different ways of doing analysis. They can ask questions of the platform for support to come in and give a hand. This is built on EC2 RDS S3. It's a simple portion of the web app, but powerful with what it can do for the researchers and enable them to do in enabling them do research faster. Searching, when we bring data onto the platform from a data provider, the first step we have to do is we have to make it so that it, it's searchable. We have to take things like the variables in the data and actually make it harmonized so it makes sense. Things like weight could be in kilograms, it could be in pounds. They need to be consistent across the board. So we harmonize the data and we index it in Elasticsearch. That allows a researcher to come to the platform, do some search on the platform and say, do you have data sets that I could potentially look at to answer my question? Uh, and then from that, on the bottom of that page, they get the ability to research, to, to request data access. This also, EC2, Elasticsearch, S3 for storage. Our data lake is S3 across the board, as you'd expect on this type of platform. But being able to search and index across different data sets allows you to form a bigger set of data for a particular researcher that they can ask a question of. Pretty powerful concept. And then discover. Discover is where once a scientist has access to a particular set of data sets or they bring their own data into the platform, they work in a secure workspace that Prod hinted at, that sort of sandbox concept, where we surface Firefox through Elasticsearch so that it keeps data in the platform, in the data lake, and we give them Jupyter Notebooks to, as a, through a browser or RStudio to use on a Spark cluster, EMR, Elastic Map Reduce cluster, against the data lake sitting at Amazon. Again, bringing researchers to the platform, keeping it secure so that we can ensure that the data doesn't leave the platform, but still allowing them to do the research. Once they've finished their notebooks, they can take those off the platform, they can publish them to the platform to share them to another researcher. Um, if they have data that they want to bring to the platform, we give them the ability to consolidate that into their own portion of our data lake. and we make it secure and compliant. And you'll notice there's a lot more icons on this slide than there were on any of the other slides. And some of these are pretty standard, I'd say, IAM for identity management, keeping roles to make sure that EMR clusters only get access to the specific S3 buckets that are important to, for that particular researcher that they've been granted access to. Certificate manager for SSL so that your browser, your connection to the platform is secure. AWS WAF for web filtering. Some of these are more interesting. Macy is a new service that we found extremely useful in analyzing our data lake and access to our platform. And I've got another slide where I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 
CloudTrail to see what's happening on the platform, who's accessing it, KMS for encryption. AWS Config allows us to see the state of our platform and its change over time. So we have Config set up not only to monitor the Amazon EC2 changes or any other Amazon changes, but also combining with EC2 Systems Manager, allowing us to see as the instances are patched, what installed software also shows up in Config for us. Pretty powerful stuff. From an overall architecture perspective, today, as of last week, we actually use 63 Amazon accounts to run the Precision Medicine platform. We have three accounts up front where we use one of those as our control account so that we can run our governance tools, uh, including things like Jenkins, uh, our radar instance, Rain Radar instance, which is based on an Elk stack, which gives us visibility into the platform. Ops works in that control environment. We have a production account where we run the production instance of the portal on the platform. And we have a dev account where we run the, the platform in as well. From a researcher perspective, the remaining 60 Amazon accounts are assigned to a research team. We made the decision very early on that it's easier to secure cross-account S3 access to EMR in a Amazon account basis as opposed to running multiple clusters within one account. So when a researcher comes onto the platform and they start using the platform and they want a workspace and they get a workspace, they're provisioned an Amazon account. And in that Amazon account, we put just their workspace. And they have the ability to add their team members to it through the portal. Since we're using AppStream, the access to that cluster is governed through the portal itself because you can make an STS call to govern that access to, to the workspace, essentially. From a portal perspective, uh, we're using things like SES to send email, Cognito to store user identities. Uh, we mentioned WAF earlier and, and CloudFront. And then Elasticsearch, and we have our data lake on S3. All of that resides on our production account. From a platform perspective, Prod mentioned that we're, we're working on quite a few compliance frameworks for the platform to get it certified. We rely heavily on automation to make sure that we're consistent across our environment. When you have more than five Amazon accounts and you want to build the same thing in those accounts, being able to do it through a pipeline makes your life easier and it makes your life very repeatable. It makes your life consistent and it becomes a very easy story to an auditor. It becomes, well, how did you do this? Well, here's the code. It's in code commit. When we want it from into a new Amazon account, we run this job. It's changed on these dates. And then you have consistency across your environment. Logging. So when we have all of these Amazon accounts across the board, it's fairly easy to pull it into one with the tools that Amazon provides. So logs from our researcher accounts on our clusters, our EMR clusters uh, in general, or VPC flow logs, everything ends up in an S3 bucket in one central Amazon account. So that can become our system of record for the platform. We use Kinesis to take the streams from each one of the CloudWatch logs in each one of the Amazon accounts to drop that into an S3 bucket that's encrypted across the board. It's MFA delete, right, enabled so that no one can delete logs. And we have our system of record in S3. And then we can use our rain radar based on the elk stack to do visualization of that data. But we know it's safe and secure in S3 since we need to be a highly we need to have our system of record. And that allows us to do it and scale across many, many, many Amazon accounts. Patching. So on any given point in time, depending upon how many researchers on the platform, I may have, we may have as many as, uh, we'll call it 40 instances 
to, we could have thousands. A researcher comes to the platform, they have the ability to control their EMR cluster, they have the ability to stop and start it from the platform itself so that they can save costs. But that means I don't have a consistent patch schedule. I don't have a consistent number of instances up at any point in time. I have to be really cloud flexible with the way I do compliance and I do patching and I do configuration management. Uh, we chose EC2 Systems Manager for this. It allows us to have things like downtime windows that are different across different sets of the platform. So for my forums servers, I can patch them independently so the forums never go down. And I mentioned earlier the tie to EC2 config for AWS config with EC2 Systems Manager so that I, at any point in time, can look in config and know what version of what software is installed on the platform and see it change over time. It's a really powerful story to tell to an auditor. So Macy came out not too long ago, and immediately we adopted using it. Uh, one of the really powerful things that we think Macy does for us is it gives us the ability to not only see what's in our data lake from a query perspective, it gives us the ability to look for certain keywords using regex patterns. So things like HIPAA patterns are already built into Macy. Really, really powerful stuff. But it also gives us heuristics and patterns of access to S3, as an example, so that you can see through the dashboards of Macy Who's accessing S3? Is it a normal pattern? Is it a normal heuristic? Is it, or is it something that you should look into? And I do have to admit, the initial scan of Macy, we found quite a few things in our control environment that we weren't happy with. So turning Macy on had us fix a, quite a few things early on. And I do want to mention there is another session tomorrow. If you want to talk about, you want to hear more about the Precision Medicine platform and how they're doing some of the config and search and that kind of thing. And at this point, if there's any questions. Thank you.